Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Sophie Schwartz is a postdoctoral fellow at Boston University Center for Autism Research Excellence and a senior project manager for the predicting and optimizing language outcomes for minimally verbal children with Autism Research Program, working alongside autism expert, Dr. Helen Tager Flussberg. For more than a decade, Sophie has studied individuals with autism who have language impairments or are minimally verbal, and more recently has narrowed that focus to consider the role that auditory processing deficits play on these language impairments. Today she'll be discussing what is known about how auditory processing deficits impact individuals with autism and what work still needs to be done. You can type your questions into the Q&A section now and throughout the talk, and she will answer what she can at the end. And now I will turn this over to Sophie. Awesome. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending, and thank you to the Autism Research Institute for hosting this webinar. Today, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes on auditory processing and autism spectrum disorders, uh, and there should be plenty of time at the end for questions and further discussion. I will note I've turned on live closed captioning on PowerPoint to make this talk more accessible, but I apologize if anything gets lost in translation. So I'd like to start the presentation off with an exercise. I want you to imagine the last time you were in a busy restaurant to the best of your ability. I know it's been some time with COVID, but imagine this and imagine that your friend is sitting across the table talking to you. So I'm going to play a clip and I want you to try to listen for what they say. And if you have any sound sensitivities, please turn your volume down at this time. Why was he having a conversation in a restaurant? Okay, now you know, now that you know what you're trying to listen to, let's play it one more time. Why was he having a conversation in a restaurant? So how'd you do? This can be a really challenging exercise, but there's a person in there saying, why must having a conversation in a restaurant be so difficult? This problem you have in a noisy restaurant is due to the fact that it can be very challenging to filter important sounds that you want to listen to, like a friend talking to you across the table, from unimportant sounds like other people talking, plates clanking, etc. Even still, we are able to do it with not too much difficulty in most settings. So while this issue may only happen to you in certain loud settings, imagine it happening to you all the time. This is what it can feel like for those who have auditory processing issues, which seem to be a particularly common problem for people with autism. It's common for people with autism from a young age to behaviorally respond atypically to sounds. In fact, because it's so common, ear covering is one of the first things people associate with autism. So in the last few slides, I asked you to imagine auditory processing issues um, that you may experience in a crowded restaurant. Imagine they happen to you all the time. Now I'm going to show a clip that gives one perspective of what this really feels like. Again, please turn your volume down if you're sensitive to sounds. <laughs> 
personality. I'm autistic. And I just get too much information. So again, this is just one perspective of what it feels like, but I think it's very telling. So auditory processing disorder specifically originates from issues with auditory attention and filtering, like your ability to listen to one person talking while someone else near you is also talking. Auditory processing disorder is not necessarily due to problems at peripheral levels of processing at the ear and brainstem, which are where you first detect and relay sounds, but rather due to problems in the brain, particularly in the auditory cortex that typically functions to prioritize and attend to sounds and remove unnecessary sounds that otherwise interfere with what you want to listen to. Simply giving a person with an auditory processing disorder a hearing aid or cochlear implant won't necessarily help because all that does for the most part is increase the volume with which all sounds come in, not just the important ones. Auditory processing disorders become more common in the general population as they reach middle and old age, but today I'll be focusing on when they arise in early childhood. So how common are sound sensitivities in children with autism? One of the largest studies to date on this topic found that over 75% of parents report that their child with autism showed signs of atypical responses to sounds, particularly covering their ears. From this and other data, it appears that sound sensitivities can be incredibly harmful to a child's emotional state, leading them to a heightened stress level, as well as harmful to their physical safety, as many resort to running away to avoid overwhelming sounds. Auditory processing issues also pose a threat to the ease at which children can readily process orally presented information and learn to acquire language by listening. Language acquisition through oral means could be a problem for people with autism in particular who show the following signs. First, most children quickly develop the ability to listen to their parents talk and detect the differences uh, between, um, sorry, um, the, uh, the difference between bat and cat, as well as learn to segment words within a sentence by detecting pauses and detecting um, patterns in how their native language is used. If the ability to hear patterns in speech sounds is reduced, as several research studies have shown, uh, it, uh, it can be in people with autism, the speech processing capabilities that depend on it may also suffer. Second, language acquisition may be a problem for those who do not respond to salient speech, including one's own name, which is one of the most common calls people respond to. From as young as six months old, children respond to their name and soon after learn its importance in directing their attention. In fact, one of the most common strategies adults use to teach children their words is saying their child's name paired with other salient directives like, look. That being said, it's maybe no surprise that failure to respond to one's own name is one of the earliest predictors of autism and language disorders. And finally, in, most, in the most serious cases, once a child becomes averse to sounds, they are more likely to avoid them completely. They could avoid sounds by covering their ears, requesting to wear headphones, uh, learning how to ignore all sound inputs altogether, or just by isolating themselves physically. And this avoidance likely leads to impoverished language exposure during critical years of language development and significantly interferes with language acquisition. So establishing how auditory processing disorders impact language acquisition is really important because currently one in every 180 people in the general population of the United States never learns fluent language. These numbers come from the fact that three in 180 people in the United States are diagnosed with autism, and one third of those with autism never learn to communicate through fluent language. These poor language outcomes are tied to a much poorer quality of life. Language impairments, especially when they are severe, make it harder for a child to learn in school, nearly impossible to work and live independently, and can cause them to be ostracized by society.
Supporting this group of people also poses a major long-term financial burden for caregivers, the medical system, and the government. According to an analysis of 2015 data, the, near, the yearly cost for an individual with autism across their lifespan is nearly twice as much if the person has an intellectual disability or major language impairment, abbreviated here as ID. In fact, if you look at just the cost of adults over 18, assuming an average lifespan of 60, which is unfortunately the upper bound of the expected lifespan for people with autism, each individual with an intellectual disability costs an average of $1.8 million more in their adult years alone than an adult with autism who does not have such disabilities. So what are we doing about this? Research has already shown us that when we detect signs of autism and language impairments earlier, it leads to more effective treatment and optimal outcomes. Nonverbal children who receive intervention are far more likely to uh, gain verbal skills when that intervention begins before the age of five. Furthermore, research shows that by investing early in these children with intensive early interventions that occur for multiple hours a week, we can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in their educational treatments throughout their later childhood years and potentially millions in their adult care services. However, there is still so much work that needs to be done to lower the age at which we're detecting signs of autism, language disorders, and auditory processing disorders, and to increase the effectiveness of the interventions we're using in order to optimize outcomes. With the current protocols in place, the average age of diagnosis of autism is four years old in the United States, and of those who do receive intervention for their autism, over half receive it for a mere one hour a week or less, which is often just not enough to make dramatic improvements. Furthermore, targets to treat sound processing disorders are not commonly the focus of those interventions, although absolutely are integrated within them. So at this point, the main way that pediatricians screen for autism-related symptoms is with questions uh, during the first three years of a child's life, as well as uh, a child's life um, at well-child visits. So uh, one of the most common checklists to use is the modified checklist for, uh, for autism in toddlers, revised. This is a 20-item checklist that asks about the child's skills. So for instance, this checklist asks explicitly about the child's early auditory attention skills like, does your child respond when you call his or her name? And does your child get upset by everyday noises? If the score for this screening is high enough, pediatricians are advised to refer the child for a developmental uh, evaluation for early intervention services, an autism evaluation, and an, auditor an audiology evaluation. So to supplement these screening tools and hopefully improve the process of early autism detection, many are also looking for biomarkers or biological screening tools that can help us detect signs of autism earlier and more effectively. Similarly, many are looking at how such a biological tool could be used as an outcome measure to help identify progress after intervention and determine which interventions work best for which children. So this brings me to my research at Boston University. Here we are trying to develop a brain measure to capture how to capture sound processing deficits that will indicate whether a young child, perhaps younger than a year old, is at risk for auditory and language processing disorders. Like many others in the field, we are trying to do this with a brain imaging technique called EEG. This is a relatively cheap and non-invasive way to capture the electrical activity on the scalp, and it allows us to measure and infer how the brain is effectively responding to sounds. So because this is a relatively new topic of study, our first step was to tackle this question in children and adolescents who already have major language impairments. Our goal with this initial research was to see whether people with major language impairments really do respond differently to sounds than their verbally fluent autistic peers, 
and if those atypical responses could be mapped onto a measure of brain response indicative of how well these individuals attend to certain sounds while filtering out others. So to start, we enrolled 83 participants with autism, ages five to 21 years old. Over half had major language impairments and are referred to moving forward as minimally verbal, and the rest had autism and were verbally fluent. To capture these participants' atypical sensory behaviors, we video recorded them as they interacted with an, exam with a, an experimenter for about an hour. We then took those videos and systematically coded when those children displayed atypical behaviors that were in response to sounds and compared it to when they displayed atypical behaviors that were in response to visual stimuli. So for reference, a visual atypical behavior might be the act of taking a crayon or finger and putting it up to the eye and waving it repetitively at different angles. It was important to compare visual and auditory behaviors because we know that children with autism do demonstrate atypical auditory and visual behaviors, but we hypothesized that it could be only atypical auditory behaviors that are tied to language input deficits while visual behaviors were not. To measure the brain's distinction between important and unimportant sounds, we played a pattern of sounds that occasionally changed. In the sound clip I'll play for you now, the sounds get louder on occasion. So typically when a sound is correctly uh, identified as different from the surrounding pattern, it is marked by the brain as important, which we can read on EEG because the brain produces an amplified response to the important sounds compared to the unimportant sounds. You can see this in the graph here. The dotted line represents the neurotypical response to an uncommon loud sound, and the solid line represents the neurotypical brain responses to the common soft sounds. Um, so within the gray shaded re uh, time region, a mere few hundred milliseconds after the sounds are heard, the loud uncommon sounds deemed more important evoke a greater response from the brain. We found a striking difference between the percent of time that participants who were minimally verbal showed in red produced atypical auditory behaviors and the time that verbally fluent participants shown in blue produced those same behaviors. In contrast, there was no difference in the percent of time that, the, that both groups engaged in atypical visual behaviors. So we interpret these findings to mean that atypical auditory but not visual behaviors were exhibited more often in minimally verbal participants than verbally fluent participants. Within the minimally verbal group, we also found that the number of words a child understood was well predicted by the increased presence of atypical auditory behaviors. This suggests a continuous relationship between sound filtering abilities and language, prof, uh, language uh, comprehension abilities. Finally, we found that minimally verbal participants with more atypical auditory behaviors showed a smaller brain response to important sounds as measured by EEG. Next, we expanded on the results of this first study with a second study, in which we asked whether minimally verbal adolescents with autism show deficits in how their brain orients to important speech in noisy scenes. To investigate this, we recorded brain activity while participants heard either their own name or other participants' names, all while a noisy restaurant background soundtrack was played. The volume of the names in comparison to the restaurant noise was similar to the volume of the soundtrack that I played for you at the beginning of this presentation. So you can imagine this feeling like you're in a crowded restaurant or a cocktail party and someone says your name behind you. 
Before I go into the details of the study, I think it's important to review why response to own name and other names was our choice of stimulus. So first, several research studies have shown that one's own name is one of the most salient things you can hear, causing even people in comas to have a brain response when hearing it. Second, behavioral response to name is seen in neurotypically developing children as early as six months old. But as I previously mentioned, failure to behaviorally respond to one's own name is one of the earliest signs of autism and language processing disorders, making it a really important thing to look at in young children. And third, several research studies have already found that as early as four to five months old, neurotypical people show a distinct brain response to their name in comparison to other names indicating real feasibility of using brain response to one's own name as an early screening tool for autism and auditory processing disorders. So in this second study, we successfully collected EEG from 74 participants ages 13 to 22 years old that either had autism and were minimally verbal, had autism and were verbally fluent, or were neurotypical and verbally fluent. And to my knowledge, this is the largest sample of minimally verbal people to date to complete a functional neuroimaging study while awake, which is very exciting. We looked at EEG brain activity along the top center of the scalp where activity from your auditory cortices converges. In neurotypical people, we found a clear difference between amplitude of response to own name and other name, people's names, shown here in the, grid, the gray shaded region on this graph, roughly between 200 and 300 milliseconds after each name was heard. We next measured the average of both of these signals during this time frame for every participant. So here is a graph showing the average amplitude response for each group in that 200 to 300 millisecond time frame along the frontal central brain region. To orient you, the green bars show the data for neurotypical participants, the blue bars show the data for participants with autism who are verbally fluent, and the red bars show the data for participants with autism who are minimally verbal. What you can see from the graph is that there was a statistically significant difference between response to own name and other name, people's names for both neurotypical participants and verbally fluent participants with autism. However, there was no such distinction between names for minimally verbal uh, participants, providing evidence that minimally verbal people are less likely to clearly differentiate their own name from someone else's. We also found a positive linear trend between the strength of unique response to one's own name and the behavior, behavioral characteristics of an auditory processing disorder that people demonstrated, like covering their ears or not responding to their name. So the takeaway message of this research so far is that auditory processing disorders impact people with autism with major language impairments. In the first study, we found that atypical auditory behaviors were displayed more in minimally verbal people with autism and that brain responses to prioritizing and differentiating important sounds from unimportant sounds were weaker in those who more commonly exhibited such behaviors. In a follow-up study, we found that minimally verbal people with autism's brain responses were not different between important and unimportant speech heard in a noisy scene, even when that important sound was one of the most salient speech sounds we hear, our own name. Furthermore, like in the first study, responses were weaker in those who more commonly exhibited atypical behaviors relating to auditory attention and filtering. So one hypothesized origin of these deficits is that a neurological imbalance of excitatory and inhibitory brain signals leads to a decreased signal to noise transmission of incoming inputs. 
This would cause rapid firing of brain signals to both important and unimportant information with little distinction or prioritization and ultimately cause important signals to get lost in the noise. One way to think about this is with the visual of a checkerboard. In the middle image, you can see um, a checkerboard with a high background noise of gray squares, which makes it harder to detect the black squares um, than if the gray squares were, were all white. You can also think about yourself living your whole life in a crowded restaurant, just trying to hear one stream of speech, but constantly being bombarded by many. Ultimately, with a system like this that does a poor job at prioritizing important sounds and filtering out unimportant ones, I believe that young children become overwhelmed by too much information and that this directly impedes their ability to learn language through sound processing. So the results from our study provide supporting evidence that atypical responses to sounds are not, a, not behavioral problems. There is biological evidence that activity in their brain is different. And if nothing else, my hope is that research, this research helps show parents that there is a very valid reason for these behaviors. The results from these studies also justify three major directions for research. First, researchers need to validate similar brain measures of auditory attention in large samples of young children with autism with major language impairments. Second, researchers need to test the efficiency of those measures as indicative of long-term outcomes, particular, particularly with regards to language. And third, researchers need to test the validity of brain measures like these as outcome measures for treatments targeting auditory attention. All three of these initiatives are ultimately aimed at detecting the signs of autism and language impairment earlier in childhood and finding optimal interventions for those children. Prior to the pandemic, we at Boston University's Center for Autism Research Excellence received support to work on all three of these initiatives and we're excited to get back to work as soon as we can do in-person testing again. So what kinds of auditory specific interventions are out there now? Well, the short answer is that while auditory components are integrated into many uh, interventions, which I'll describe more into uh, a little bit in the next slide, very little work has been done to develop robust interventions that target sound processing deficits specifically. One of the only auditory specific trainings that has been developed is a technique called auditory integration training. The premise of this training is that children listen to filtered speech and sounds to help them focus on language specific frequencies. However, the, the evidence to date that this treatment works is minimal. Studies that have tested this training have had small sample sizes and very poor design. However, given that we are finding evidence of auditory specific impairments in many of these children, there is a strong incentive for researchers to develop and empirically test the use of sound-based interventions that could better target auditory processing disorders. Auditory specific impair, uh, interventions could be beneficial not only to children with autism, but also to various other populations that experience auditory processing issues across the lifespan. So while there is no auditory specific validated intervention available for people with autism, there are several established interventions I'd like to note that could absolutely help people with autism who show signs of an auditory processing disorder. Oops. Okay. Um, so in particular, I suspect the treatments that target joint attention, which is the ability to attend to important auditory and visual cues for communication, would be helpful. One example of this is a treatment called JASPER, which has been validated by several large randomized control studies. In addition, advocating that your child receive intervention from a speech language pathologist is key. These pathologists have training to focus on language processing and production in a quiet one-on-one -on -one setting. Recent research has also shown that educating parents to implement 
communication-based interventions provides more opportunities for nonverbal children with autism to learn and results in greater child gains. Other interventions that may aid children with auditory processing deficits include teaching the child how to self-regulate -re with breathing when they are overwhelmed by sound, using a multimodal approach to communication, pairing visual inputs like pictures or gestures with your oral input, and acclimating the child to sound mixtures through music, as well as potentially using the rhythm of song to augment language. Similarly, for children in classroom settings, there are additional educational accommodations that could help. Some examples include getting a child's attention other ways besides just calling their name, providing a quiet workstation for children to go to, minimizing proximity to windows, clapping and fans, repeating instructions one-on-one -on -one after giving them to the group, and presenting materials both orally and visually. One way that institutions can also help is by providing sensory friendly spaces for children who are overwhelmed by sound. Several major institutions like the Smithsonian have already shown how easy and beneficial these incentives uh, and initiatives can be. So to get us to a place where more children are receiving services and accommodations for their auditory processing deficits, Work is needed not just from researchers and parents and educators, but also healthcare and government providers to support these increased initiatives. As I said before, increased funding and support for early detection and intervention before the age of five can make a huge difference for children who are not talking and can be a major contributing factor for their quality of life, not to mention their long-term cost. Quality of life can also be improved through the educational accommodations and sensory friendly spaces that I just described. So if you'd like to read more about uh, the research I've described today or other research on auditory processing disorders, particular, particularly in autism, I'd recommend looking at the following websites from Boston University, Autism Speaks, the Simons Foundation, the Interactive Autism Network, and the American Speech Language Hearing Association. I'd also like to plug one way that you can participate in research we're conducting at Boston University right now, while we're conducting research completely remotely. This is a, a, a research study to understand language development in children with autism, particu particularly ages three to eight years old who are minimally verbal or have challenges with language and speech. Participation takes three hours over the course of a month to complete. If you're interested, please email us at polo at bu.edu or visit us online at bu.edu slash autism or facebook.com slash care at BU. Um, so now I'd like um, to invite you uh, to ask questions or even just share with everyone, what are the implications of this research for you? And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. All right, Sophie, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, the first thing that many people are asking is if they can get a copy of the slides. So if that's something that you can share, um, I can share the handouts after the talk on the playback page. So if, if that's something you can do. Otherwise, uh, people can also review the slides in the playback once we post it online. So if you provide that, that's great. I'll share it. And if not, everyone just know that you can look at the slides in the playback. They will be on autismwebinars.com or .org. I apologize later today. Uh, we did have a lot of questions, so <laughs> I can launch into those. The first one was about finding knowledgeable providers who can both assess for auditory processing issues and then what instruments that they might be using for that so that a parent or a teacher would know what they're looking at. So do you have suggestions about assessment and also people who are knowledgeable about how to care for it? 
Yeah, so both audiologists and speech language hearing, uh, speech and language pathologists um, have expertise in identifying um, some of these characteristics. The tests that are used are not necessarily very precise. They're mostly behavioral measures. So at where you, um, a child has to hear different words in a noisy background, very much like what we did, um, and report back those words. So if they have language, they can report back the words. We can also have them point, we can present a bunch of images and, and um, present a sound, a, a, a sentence or a word in noise and have them point to the image that they heard in the noise at different increasing levels of noise. Um, and that might get around uh, for children that aren't able to um, produce language, they can at least point to the language. If they can't do either of those things, then again, there are more limited options. Um, audiologists can try to do some, um, some, um, ear-based um, assessments like an OAE um, to get at sort of peripheral level sound processing, but at the higher level of sound processing, I don't really know of any um, practitioners that are working specifically with minimally verbal children. That being said, um, the American Speech Hearing Language Association has resource um, groups that, that work with certain communities, like at the state level, that might be able to help. Um, and um, I'd say Facebook is also a really good place to find other people in your area and see who they are going to. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think that the, the, the um, state of the field is really where it needs to be to be um, assessing and providing intervention for um, these auditory processing disorders. Okay. So the next question is about coping at school. And I know you talked about this a bit. I mean, you talked a bit about these noisy environments and gave us some examples. Um, there are different things that teachers do do to try to mitigate some of that exposure. So headphones and, and those sorts of things. Do you have any thoughts about effective strategies that you've seen used in classrooms? Or does it really just have to be a dynamic process for most individuals? Yeah, all and all, all treatments are re really need to be individualized to the individual to the child. If they are in a classroom that again allows for a quiet workspace or um, you know this quiet corner they can go to that's a little bit more shielded from everything else um, that could help. And then again, providing as many sources of input of instructions and communication as possible. Um, one of the things that um, I think is a big issue, but we, you know, what are we going to do about it is that classrooms are very, um, they're very loud, there's reverberation in the walls. So the ways that classrooms are built are just make everything louder, unfortunately. So, um, you know, without rebuilding all these classrooms, you know, we do need to think about how the classroom environment is impacting children. Um, you know, again, things like headphones could work in certain settings, but then again, when you're putting headphones on the child, you are isolating them um, from not, they, they aren't able to have that same language exposure. So finding that balance for each child is important as well. All right, this next question is from an adult on the spectrum who is listening today. Um, she's wondering about how this translates into adulthood. And I know that your work has been with children primarily, but are there resources she could look at or is there a dearth of information about auditory processing for adults? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, for some people, those auditory processing deficits or, or differences change as they get older, but for others, it, they're still there. Maybe, maybe you learn how to cope with them a little bit more, maybe you don't, um, but for a lot of people it is there. And, and you think about in the general population, as you reach middle and older ages, age, auditory processing issues arise. So you can imagine that maybe even someone who had sound processing issues as a child, um, maybe worked through them a bit as an adolescent, and then as they get to middle or old age, they would start to come back or maybe even get worse. Um, I think that um, there are um, autism self advocate, the um, autism network, autism self advocate network is a good place. Um, and again, 
Facebook, things like that. Um, I think that there are, there are people looking at um, auditory processing and sensory differences in adults, um, again, that are verbal. We actually, in our lab, um, if you go to bu.edu slash autism, there is a study we have going on called Atlas that is asking about um, how sensory differences may impact a child who is transitioning from um, into their adult, um, their adult services. Um, but again, it's unfortunately, we, it's very hard for us to do research on adults with autism who don't have language because there are a lot of barriers um, in terms of them being able to provide consent and um, just sort of there's all these logistics, I guess. Um, but yeah, so I think, um, you know, I think you're to the person who asked this question, you're definitely not alone. Um, you know, there are, um, there are others out there and um, you may be able to find a research study that you can help advance this, this field with um, by doing, maybe there's a remote study out there that is um, trying to look at, at creating a, uh, you know, addressing these issues and, and create maybe an auditory training um, for for adults as well. So this is, I know you talked about AIT and some of those other treatments, um, and you may have touched on this a little bit. How about music therapy? Is it recommended or is it similar in, in its sort of status in terms of studies? And how does it rate as sort of a palliative care? Yeah, music therapy is sort of that in between. I listed in the in in the um, intervention slide as um, possibly a good option. Um, uh, auditory integration training has sort of been notorious for charging a lot of money and sort of having a lot of again not a lot of evidence to support it. Um, music therapy, we are starting to do some research that shows that it could work, um, but the sample sizes again are quite small, um, specifically for the minimally verbal and nonverbal kids. Um, but we do know that kids enjoy music; they enjoy songs. And even if a child isn't talking very much, they may start to catch on to words through song. Um, the, it, whether it's the rhythm of the song or um, just something else, like there are certain songs that do support at least some sort of scripted or non-spontaneous language that, that then maybe the child can build spontaneous language off of. Um, and then again, I think that music could be a, a nice way to introduce more complex sounds to the child, but um, in sort of a, the, the pleasing sounds. Um, but again, it depends on the child. And at this point, I haven't seen enough research to show that music therapy, especially alone, will lead to significant language gains. Um, but I think that it, um, you know, that that therapy paired with other things could um, lead to better outcomes. Okay, and we did get quite a few comments from parents and some adults who felt that music therapy or different listening therapies they'd done had been beneficial, at least from a palliative perspective. Do you know of any studies that are, are underway right now specifically on those? Or is that just, it's, I know research funding is pretty precious. So not to put pressure on you to know everything about the research that's out there, but are you aware of anything going on right now? No, I'm not. Um, again, we planned we plan on um, doing an intervention like this um, uh, in older children um, to start, um, but COVID has put that on hold for right. right now. Right, and hard to do right now, these in-person kind of studies for right. sure with everything that's going on. Thanks. We've gotten a lot of comments and questions about that, so thanks for uh, following yeah. up on that. So this next question is about um, using, actually, we've got a couple questions on this thread about using ASL and how sign language ties in with um, people who have these, either who have minimal verbal abilities or who have these sensitivities or different processing issues. How does sign language tie into that? Has there been any investigation of that? Um, yes, so um, there, there has been, and I think this really ties into what I mentioned on several sides about multimodal communication. So providing as many options for the child to communicate and to understand what is going on around them as possible and also to be able to understand that 
communication maps onto things that we are talking about. So providing a picture, the name written out, um, a sign. I hear from a lot of these parents that their, their children are hyperlexic. They understand that words, written out words, do map onto something and, the, and they sort of can grasp that language it that way. For others, it is sign language. Um, for others, it's other gestures, um, pointing, um, you know, and pairing that with the auditory input and doing that very early on provides more opportunities for the child, again, to find their way to communicate. Um, um, AAC devices, those used to be, um, you know, paper with little um, tokens. Now we have iPads every, you know, and children or children can use these these devices to um, to press, you know, a button that says the that has a picture, has the written item, and says it out loud. Um, and so pairing all these things, I mean, you're just it's not th that much effort in my mind for what it could possibly um, do for their outcomes. So uh, yes. Um, off the top of my head in terms of research, I know there are, um, there are studies out of, um, in, in, uh, Connecticut as well as Ohio that are looking at gesture use and sign language use, um, related to, um, language in autism, so. All right. So other questions that we've gotten, and you and I touched on the, I know you touched on this a bit and you, you and I touched on it before the talk. Just about the sort of neurobiological aspects of, of this and different research that neurologists are doing on specifically on the brain and development. Um, do you have any insight about sort of what current thinking is about when this occurs, if there's some sort of um, specific time frame when, when uh, the biology of the brain is affected? or anything that parents might be aware of in terms of really early signs that they can look for in children? Yeah, I can touch on that. And then I was skimming the Q&A and found another one that I think would be good to answer, which I'll get to um, next. Um, so yes, yeah, so, you know, from what we know, autism, you are, you are born with autism. You, there are genetic pre, you know, predictors um, you know, that, that cause the brain to um, be functioning differently from infancy. Um, that's why we think that we can potentially get, you know, use brain um, imaging tools to detect those signs really early on. You know, we know behaviorally we can detect it for many kids between the ages of two and five, not everyone, lots slip through the cracks and that's why the um, average age of diagnosis in this country is still four. Um, but, you know, there are early indicators, um, there's, there's work being done looking at children at risk for autism, either because they have an older sibling with autism or they fail the screener that I mentioned earlier, um, suggesting that, um, you know, that they're not responding to their name. They're not pointing at things, really early indicators. Um, and these screeners, I should say, that, that are done at these well-child visits, look at them with your pediatrician um, at every, at every um, year mark. Look at them and see where you fit, uh, you know, based on that threshold. Um, because it doesn't hurt to go get an early intervention um, evaluation, determine if, if your child is eligible. If you are worried, um, it, can, it can help. Um, and yeah, we're just, you know, we're just, this is again, a very new thing for us. Our technologies are just getting greater and greater. Um, and so we are really, you know, pushing along and trying to find ways that we can detect um, biologically signs within that first year of life um, and then be able to get the, the child into early intervention services as quickly as possible. Um, I wanted to, one person on here asked about um, their child who loves noise. Um, and I think that's important to, to address. So the atypical auditory behaviors I describe are not just being overwhelmed by noise or, um, you know, not, they can, they can actually 
you know, be interested in um, certain noises. And I think that aligns with, they're not filtering out the same sounds that we would filter out. And they're, you know, something like a blender or a vacuum is not, um, I don't know what else, the, it's not spectrally um, interesting to most of us. The, the sound, the sort of buzzing sound isn't very, isn't something we usually gravitate to. That's something most people learn from a very young age that it's not as interesting um, as speech, which is more dynamic. And so they filter that out and, um, and attend to the speech. And so if the child is, is really interested in those sounds, again, it sort of indicates that they're not filtering things in the same way that we would want, or they're not prioritizing the sounds that a neurotypical person might prioritize. Um, so again, that doesn't mean that the, that behavior is um, not okay. Um, it just means that you want to um, make sure that they are able to attend to uh, the sounds that are that go into speech, not only these sort of um, these sounds that won't, won't um, contribute to language acquisition. Okay. This next question is about the presence of these auditory processing differences without autism. So recognizing that in individuals who don't necessarily have autism, autism spectrum disorder, and you touched on the percentage of parents who reported auditory differences for kids on the spectrum. Um, how common is it in the, in the general pop? I'm not sure. I the estimates aren't really clear, um, in part because um, auditory processing disorder is not in the DSM, um, the diagnostic um, manual for that, you know, sort of provides incentive for some of these services um, and sensory processing disorder more broadly. Um, so I can't speak to that. Um, my focus really has been on auditory processing within those with autism. Um, it very well could be some sort of issue again with how the brain is able to pick out important sounds from unimportant sounds. Um, and this, um, this hypothesis that I mentioned, this noisy brain theory that um, the, um, the balance of excitatory and inhibitory signals is, um, is different and that that's contributing to sort of how much input you get and um, what input you're filtering. But unfortunately, I just can't speak um, much to sort of auditory processing disorders in the general population. I, I know that it's pretty rare. Um, yeah. Got it. So this question is coming up in several different questions as a theme, but one thing that parents experience, and I know I've, I've observed this myself, um, their child is sensitive to external sounds, but not to their own sounds. So they'll cover their ears when another child screams or if there's a loud noise, but they will scream themselves quite loudly or will do a lot of self-talk. So lots of self-talking and chattering, but if somebody else is doing it, then, then it's different. So can you, do you have any insight about what that might be? Um, well, again, it really is a matter of sort of filtering and what, what sounds they, they are listening to. Them screaming may be a way for them to filter out other sounds. Um, their production of, of their sounds is in their control. In fact, one of the auditory behaviors that um, were, was looked at in the first study, um, it wasn't just ear covering, it was also things like humming to themselves, um, bring, you know, producing more sound in certain ways, just filtering, they're modifying their sound environment in ways that were atypical for, for someone their age. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, I think, I personally think that the, um, if a child is engaging in self-talk, that can be really useful for, um, for maybe regulating their, their sound environment for them, and it helps them with their language acquisition, potentially. Um, you know, I, I guess that's all I have to say about that. 
Okay. So if they can control the sound, that, that, that may just be different. And as you say, it blocks out external sounds. So maybe, sure. yeah, possibly at least for certain individuals, that could be the yeah. case. Honestly, my guess is as good as you guys for a lot of this. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you know, every one of you that has a child with autism or knows a child with autism, the, your experience is different. Um, you know, I have my experiences and we're, we're, you know, approaching this from a research point of view and getting as much information as we can. But that's why, you know, I say right on here, you know, share with us, what are the implications of this research for you? Um, because it's a learning process for all of us. All right. Well, this next um, question is just a, a sort of high level question. And again, we've talked about these other palliative um, services that people do access, but have you seen anything about sort of equestrian, horseback, those sorts of programs linking to auditory processing specifically? Uh, parents tell stories sometimes about, you know, the my child likes to talk when she's on her horse and she doesn't talk at other times or those sorts of things. So have you heard any of those sort of, of anecdotes and what are your thoughts? Yeah, I've heard lots of anecdotes about how um, for some children or adults with autism, interacting with an animal can be very soothing. For others, it can be very anxiety producing. It really just depends. I don't have any expertise in how um, that sort of therapy would uh, relate to auditory processing. So, right, there could be all sorts of emotional or uh, sensory issues that we just don't have a lot of data about at this time. That's right. All right. So other strategies that teachers and parents can be thinking about, I had several comments. People were really grateful that you talked about the idea that this information needs to be disseminated into the medical community and, and into other communities so that people are aware of it, not necessarily being prescriptive about it, but just creating that awareness. Um, have you got suggestions for parents who want to provide really I'd say um, helpful and maybe brief resources that they could give to a clinician or a occupational therapist or somebody who's working with their child. Um, or a book that, that you found really helpful in, in that realm that's, that's sort of high level. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there are books out there. There's the, um, you know, you can get the research um, that, um, the so from the links that I provided, um, there's information as well as articles like, um, you know, um, um, peer reviewed research articles that sh that talk about the evidence for sound processing differences in people with autism. Um, I think you know it really comes down to especially at that young age, getting your medical practitioner to um, get, you know, help you get as much intervention as you can if you see um, signs of an auditory processing issue or any issue really with autism or language um, because those first five years are critical. Um, you know, and it really is at the, at the level of the medical. And when I say medical, um, the medical field, I mean, not just the doctors, but the health insurance companies, you know, the people that are, you know, we need to figure out some way to, um, to indicate to, you know, and convince these people that by, in, by spending a little bit more money in the first five years of a child's life, they will save money in the, in the long term, um, and that it will really help these individuals. So really, um, you know, that one hour of intervention is not, a week is not enough. Um, there are um, several research studies, uh, you know, in this presentation, I had little DOI links at the bottom of each of those slides. Those are articles that you can get that support th the things I was saying in the presentation. Print those out, hand them to the doctor, hand them to whoever, you know, maybe they'll, they'll read the abstract and, and, and sort of um, take that as, okay, this, this is their, you know, this person's done their homework, here's, here, you know, here's this information. Um, yeah. 